<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our session momentarily. If you could all take a seat. Where's the clicker? Okay, forward and back, right? Okay. That's good. I hate these screens because they make me look really <laughs> old, and I also see how little hair I have. <laughs> why, why do they put these screens uh, where we can see ourselves, right in front of us? Oh, my. Oh. Oh. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our session this morning on cancer. I'm so aware of not being really mean, mean when I ask uh, people to come draw their attention forward. Uh, everyone's so obliging. Thank you so much for making this easy, easier. All right, today's session is on uh, cancer in First Nations in British Columbia. Thank you all so much for being here. We know that you had lots of choices about where you could be today. Uh, and who doesn't want to do something about cancer? From uh, my work on the board of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, uh, a $10 million, or sorry, a $100 million 10-year project by the federal government to bring together cancer partners so that they can improve their work. Um, I know that, uh, from coast to coast to coast, from community to community, non-Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people, uh, we all know that there's more that could be done, and we all know that we are going to be affected by cancer, or we've been affected by cancer uh, in our families, in our communities, amongst our loved ones, and maybe even uh, ourselves as individuals, that perhaps amongst you, uh, there are a goodly number of survivors and people who've been on a, a very concerted cancer journey. So today we have a, a few experts and we've been working on a presentation for you that we would like to um, go through so that we can throw open the floor. But one of the first things we'd like to do is to make sure that we're all in, uh, kind of all on the same page, landing on the same page. Uh, for the First Nations Health Authority, we understand that we, we at the First Nations Health Authority, and I really shouldn't even say we because I work for the Ministry of Health, uh, and I don't uh, speak for the First Nations Health Authority, but we do work collaboratively. At the First Nations Health Authority, we're very clear that we need partnerships in cancer, that we, as First Nations, are not taking over and isolating ourselves uh, in cancer services. We're not taking a section of the BC Cancer Agency and saying we, as First Nations, are going to deal with cancers by ourselves. That is not the situation. It's very clear in the case of cancer that we need our experts, and we need an expert agency, and we need our partners regionally and centrally. So with that in mind, we have a few speakers from a few different areas, and that's why we would like to present now uh, on, uh, from a few different perspectives, uh, describing services just to re-familiarize you uh, with uh, the cancer journey for um, different kinds of uh, persons with different kinds of cancers from different parts of the province. I forgot to say my name is Tlesla Evan Adams. I'm the provincial, sorry, the deputy provincial health officer for Aboriginal Health, and I sit on the board of the Canadian Partnership uh, Against Cancer. Uh, and my mother is a breast cancer survivor, and we walked that journey together, um, and partly with Nadine Curran uh, a few years ago. And uh, she's well, uh, but it was definitely uh, a very different experience to walk it personally than as a clinician. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Nadine Caron and Dr. Nick Foster to come and join us. Nadine Caron um, is known to many of you, perhaps some of you heard her speak uh, yesterday. She's a First Nation surgeon uh, in Prince George uh, and attached to 
uh, the University of Northern British Columbia, and uh, a dear friend, one of my inspirations to go into medicine, Nick Foster is a Kiwi and has been with uh, the BC Cancer Agency for several months now on loan from the BC Center for Disease Control. He's the Chief Operating Officer, BC Cancer Agency. So if I can invite you both up. And hopefully you all have your little clickers, your voters, for the later part of the presentation. If you don't have one, if you could put your hands up and we'll bring you one. Good morning. Thank you. Just to echo Evan's words, really, is to thank you so much for coming. Uh, cancer is about 90 plus, more than 90 percent of the uh, work that I do as a clinician, meaning patients that I see that come to me with the diagnosis of cancer, come to me with the concern that they may have cancer, or come to me with the possibility with things like a lump that they can feel in their breast or other symptoms that they or their doctor or a family member has noticed that they want investigated to figure this out. And I have to say that uh, I echo Evan's words as well in terms of the experience of going through this as a clinician. It can be heart-wrenching itself, but I can't imagine going through it personally, but I have walked that journey with loved ones and how terrifying it can be. The things that really fill that gap to make something scary slightly less scary, to, say, to make something that hurts slightly less painful, to make someone's journey improve, there are ways to do that. But the thing is that the answers don't lie with the cancer agency or with your physician or with the hospital administrators, and we know that. Because as First Nations people throughout British Columbia, there are gaps in our services, not just in something not being there, but something being right there, but just not fitting with us, not feeling right. Perhaps it's around the cultural competency that we discussed the other day. Perhaps it's the challenges that our communities have that are different. Perhaps it's where a lot of us live in terms of rural, remote, northern. Whatever it is, what we're looking for today is to start figuring out that partnership with agencies like the, the BC Cancer Agency, with the PHSA, with our health authorities, with our hospitals, with our healthcare providers, and recognizing that we can improve these partnerships so that if we ever go through this journey, that it's gonna be something that we have designed and worked together so that we know what we're doing. The other thing is, and I've talked to Joe a lot about this, is the other part of it is really shifting our focus, the wellness aspect of it. And I think this is one area that we can be leaders in First Nations where a lot of the focus when it comes to the Ministry of Health, sorry Evan, he is associated with the Ministry of Health, is the fact that they focus on the diagnosis and the treatment, which is exactly what they're supposed to do. But like we said yesterday, forgetting about the prevention and the screening, which can really change the number of people who have to go down this path and how they go down it. And so one of the things that we can do is work on that prevention, that wellness model that we know intuitively, so that not only is that healthcare system going to be there for us, that's going to be culturally competent and more in partnership with what we need and what we expect and what we deserve, but it's going to be a building down the street that hopefully less of us need and that less of us need to utilize because of the prevention that we go through and because of the screening. And that's uh, looking at the whole journey and the whole spectrum. And we're really looking forward today to get your input in terms of what your expectations are, what your desires are, what your concerns are. And please feel free to, whether it's in the small group breakout sessions at your table, or if it's question and answers, or it's, it's comments you want to make when we're going through some of the questions that we ask up here, please feel free to have your voice heard. And if this is not the forum, there's also a table downstairs that you can go and talk to, the, to us about. And of course, there's also just individual communication that uh, we can make available to you so that if there's something that you need to say, there's always a place where your voice will be heard. And that's the beautiful thing about what our approach is going to be and what the First Nations Health Authority is aiming to do. Thanks.
I hate these screens. I realise how little hair I have left. It's, uh, normally I don't have to, you know, see that part of me. Um, my name's Nick Foster, as uh, Evan uh, introduced. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the First Nations Health Authority. I think huge accomplishments, and uh, I'm very proud to be standing here and, and uh, privileged, I believe. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting uh, the BC Cancer Agency to be here today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Coast Salish uh, for uh, holding this, this event in their territory. Um, and before I start, I'd like to introduce some key people from the Cancer Agency who are here today. They're, they're, they're among you. Uh, so we have uh, Fiona Walks. If you could just stand up, Fiona. Fiona is our VP of Safety, Quality, and Supportive Care. Uh, Marianne Taylor, somewhere here, is our, our VP of Systemic Therapy. Uh, we have Pam Tobin, who is our Regional Director of Operations for Centre of the North, and also has been a, a, a key figure for us in uh, a lot of our Aboriginal work to date. Lisa Khan is our Senior Director of Screening uh, for, the, for the province, uh, for our agency. Um, and Lesley Valley is here, of course, uh, from PHSA. Um, Right. Can we have the presentation, please? There we are. So um, it's customary where I'm from, and I believe it's true here too, that one uh, introduces oneself a little bit. So I'm going to do that, even though Evan did that. Uh, so where I'm from, this is called a mihi mihi. And uh, uh, so I'm from Aotearoa, or New Zealand, and um, I have lived in various areas, and I've been very privileged to, to live and work uh, in, in two areas in particular. One is uh, Rotorua, and, uh, which also incorporated Topo, and the other one is Tairawhiti, uh, which are both areas with a very high Maori population, 35% uh, plus. Uh, and as such, had, uh, I worked there both as a clinician uh, and then later I actually came back to uh, Rotorua as, as their chief operating officer. Uh, so had uh, really fantastic experience and, and uh, involvement in, in the delivery of culturally appropriate care. Because uh, many of you know, I, I, um, I believe, you know, how, how things are down there. Um, still work to do, of course, uh, but uh, there are some, some great initiatives. Um, I then came to Canada. Don't you like that? I did that last night. That was fun. Um, it's not to scale, by the way. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've, I worked, I've worked at those three places, as Evan uh, talked about. And uh, I just want to acknowledge Melanie Rivers is in the room uh, from Squamish Nation. And uh, I was very privileged to work with Melanie at the BC Centre for Disease Control. Uh, and she is now, as of day three, with the First Nations Health Authority. Where is, where's Melanie? Yep. So. <laughs> so, the challenge. And I, I'm, I know a lot of you know this, and in fact, Nadine kind of did my talk yesterday, so, and did it much better than I can, so I'm going to be really quick. Because uh, I really, um, you know, we're here to listen. Uh, so I'm going to be really quick. Um, I want to talk about very briefly, you know, the incidence and prevalence of cancer. So the incidence is the, the number of new cases, um, and the prevalence is the number of cases existing, so it includes people living with cancer. Um, it's increasing. It's increasing uh, by, you know, 3% plus a year. Uh, that's a significant challenge for all of us. Um, we heard these stats yesterday. Two out of five Canadians are expected to develop cancer during their lifetime. One out of four Canadians are expected to die. So, you know, the good news here is not everyone with cancer dies from it, right? Uh, and, um, you know, the odds are, are getting better and better. And in fact, British Columbia leads Canada in its uh, outcomes uh, for, for cancer uh, as a province. And we'll come back uh, to that a bit. 
the patient journey, Nadine really went through this very well yesterday. Um, and the BC Cancer Agency incorporates most components of this, uh, all of them to some extent. Um, so the one area where we're probably less involved, uh, because it really spans into public health, is prevention. Um, and the, as we heard yesterday, healthy weight, not smoking, uh, you know, alcohol, exercise. Um, they're, they're great preventative measures for cancer. They're also great preventative measures for heart disease and, and uh, other components. So they're really a very much a, a public health measure. We have um, screening programs, and I'll, I'll talk about those uh, shortly, just very briefly. Uh, but really, the cancer agency, uh, it, it encompasses each component of this. Um, with really an emphasis, you know, the bulk of our, our activities are really around screening and treatment and uh, follow-up survivorship uh, and end of physical life care. The modalities of treatment, uh, I'm sure most of you know this, is uh, surgery, radiation therapy and chemotherapy, which is the drug therapy. There are a lot of developments in drug therapy. Um, particularly the move to more oral medications rather than intravenous medications. Uh, and secondly, the role of genetic testing. And um, genetic testing really is about, it's really personalizing medicine. So we know, for example, there are some medications that only certain people will respond to and, and it's related to their genetic makeup. Uh, that's really important because one, you can actually avoid giving someone a toxic drug which isn't going to do any good. Um, and secondly, uh, you can give treatments that are effective for that individual. And I think really in the next uh, 10 years, it's already starting, but in the next 10 years, we're going to see a huge growth in the role of genetic testing. Uh, and that also will be combined, I think, with change in the way we administer treatment. And I think there's huge opportunity in that. Uh, and an opportunity for, you know, uh, First Nations in that too, because it, it, it changes how we deliver care. And related to that is with the growth of incidence and, and prevalence and uh, survivorship, so more and more people surviving cancer, so they're, they're living longer and some get second cancers. You know, they, they, uh, they get a different cancer. Uh, with that, we have to change the way we deliver our care um, because it's really not sustainable. Can't tell you exactly what that answer is yet. So uh, I'm gonna tell you about the BC Cancer Agency. Um, we're an agency of the Provincial Health Services Authority which is the authority you've never heard of, really. Um, mainly because it, it's not a regional health authority, un unlike Vancouver Coastal or Northern Health or whatever. It has a province-wide mandate, and it's actually a society. So it's actually like the First Nations Health Authority. It's not really an authority at all, I guess. Um, but it's made up of these societies, and of course, cancer's top of the list because I put the slide together. Um, <laughs> But you'll recognize a number of these. Um, our mandate is really to deliver population-based control programs. And the beauty of this is the concept is it doesn't matter where you are in the province, you should receive the same standard of care and the same protocol of care. And uh, for the most part, I think we do our best to make that happen. And uh, I think that really relates to the outcome. So uh, if Max Coppice, the president, my boss, uh, all of our bosses here, <laughs> if, he, if he was here, he would point out how in America there may be a really fantastic cancer hospital, but you can be two hours down the road and go to another hospital and it won't be so good. Whereas in BC, it's consistent. And uh, there's, there's strength in that. Aren't you pleased I'm not going to read every word? Um, so we have six uh, sites, and um, 
physical sites in, in the sense of buildings, and I, I, I never like concentrating on buildings too much, but these are important because this is where radiotherapy is delivered. Radiotherapy requires special buildings, and um, uh, that's what those have, and, and you'll see that there's basically uh, one in every health authority, two in Fraser. Uh, and then we have a number of other sites, and I'll, I'll let you look at this for a moment. Um, we have, I think it's 38 screening mammography centers. We have a number of regional chemotherapy clinics. Uh, and we, we have networks. We have community oncology networks, and, and we really use a, a network uh, um, system to help deliver care closer to home. Uh, so screening, uh, we operate screening, cervical, mammography, colon screenings just started. Hereditary Cancer Program is really a counselling and genetic testing service for people uh, who meet the criteria or are at risk. Cervical screening, oh, sorry, uh, colon, uh, mammography, I'm jumping around. Mammography program, we have, I think it's 38 fixed sites, Lisa, that's right, and three mobile vans. and. Um, there's been, I think, actually a lot of good work with screening in terms of um, uh, improving access to First Nations communities, uh, particularly with the use of the mobile vans, I think, in the more, more remote. Prevention, uh, we heard yesterday, we, we have a very small prevention program, as I mentioned earlier. We work closely with the public health community uh, and um, uh, really focusing on awareness and education. And uh, population health is really about surveillance and outcome evaluation. I've just got two, three more slides, and I just want to talk very briefly about our Aboriginal health initiatives, uh, our more recent initiatives. And uh, the first is the contributing to the Aboriginal cancer care strategy in the north. And uh, many of you will be familiar with this, but I did want to highlight that the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, CPAC, uh, are funding uh, at this point the development uh, of a, um, a proposal uh, which First Nations Health Authority is, I think, leading uh, with us uh, in support, along with our Métis and Inuit partners, uh, to develop a cancer control strategy for the province. And I think that, uh, I've got that right, Lisa, right? Uh, Pam, yes. Um, so, Lisa's going, what? Um, so, uh, that's going to be really, really interesting, and I really hope it, it, it gets supported by, by CPAC, and uh, you know, I'm fingers crossed I think it will. Screening mammography. Um, the uh, Lisa and her team have done a lot of work about improving uh, take-up rates and uh, participation rates and uh, culturally appropriate materials and so forth. Um, the outcomes uh, unit, which is the population health unit, um, are currently working with the First Nations uh, Health Authority to link our cancer registry, which records in, uh, patients with cancer and their outcomes, uh, with the First Nation client file. So that's something that First Nations Health Authority are, are leading, because uh, we appreciate it's, it's uh, your data uh, in that sense. And, uh, but that will really help us. Uh, the last time anything like this was done was about 12 years ago. And the numbers were so small, it was really hard to draw any real conclusions. And, you know, uh, information is, is, is power. It's really important. We need to know. We need to know how we're doing um, if we're going to get better. And prevention programs I've mentioned. Um, oh, I should acknowledge that the, those photos uh, came from a photo competition of youth in the Centre for the North when they were doing their um, uh, cancer control strategy. I, th I think they're just absolutely stunning. Um, con in conclusion, the Cancer Agency wants to become a more culturally appropriate and supportive organisation. We're committed to doing that. Uh, we've got a new president, we've got a new chief operating officer, We've got a, um, you know, we're, we're starting our strategic planning. This is just perfect timing for Joe to reach out to us. We're committed to bringing the successes of cancer care to First Nations communities. 
Uh, as I said, I think we do well on, on a provincial basis, but they're always, you know, we need to do, you know, there'll be areas where you need to do better. Um, and we really value the partnership that's developing with the First Nations Health Authority. And finally, we're here to listen. A number of us are here from the, the senior team, and uh, you've heard enough of me talking, and now I'm really interested to hear you guys talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Uh, let's call you Nick, if that's okay. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Caron, and we'll call you Nadine, right? Because I think it's, it's, it's very important for uh, doctors to be approachable and uh, uh, for us to be a little less formal. So if we've all agreed, then that's, then that's great. So, so Nick and Nadine, thank you for that. And uh, I would like to leave uh, you some room to ask any questions at this point. We, have, uh, we could probably take a few questions, just keeping in mind that our main objective today is, to, is for you to um, discuss some questions and leave us, uh, leave us all with some ideas on how we might improve cancer care or add to the cancer care continuum of services or how we might be of help directly to First Nations clients and communities. Yes. So the question was how we're going to make our programs more culturally appropriate. Um, well, I think, I think probably in two main ways at least off the top of my head. The first one is there's a cultural competency program uh, that uh, PHSA has developed, and um, we need to, the uptake at the cancer agency has been poor, in my view, it's been low. Uh, so that's something we are gonna be uh, pushing and uh, you know, building. I think the uh, second thing would be the cancer control strategy that, uh, you know, fingers crossed, goes forward. The CPAC cancer control strategy, I think, will be very informative. And the third thing is we need feedback. We need to hear. We need to listen. And uh, that's probably the most important thing, to be honest. And um, I think the process starts today, in a sense. And. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, these group discussions going to be very important. And, uh, if I could add, um, that, that is question number three. We have three questions to discuss today, and that's actually th yeah. the third yeah. one. So. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be asking it back to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a short test at the end, right? <laughs> right yes, please. Yes, yeah, Cook's Jam. Uh, Chief Fred Sampson, Siski Indian Band. Um, one of my questions was exactly on the same line in regards to traditional foods and, and how they would fit within cancer treatment. Um, also, uh, you mentioned that uh, preventive was actually a, a, a small part of the programs that you deliver. Well, I believe that needs to be quite a bit larger. And thirdly, uh, is in regards to uh, the genetic information that you're talking about, uh, realizing that the position of the federal government is to talk about quantum blood and there was a real fear around the collection of genetic information. Um, so I b would just be curious as to how you would protect that to make me feel comfortable in giving up my genetic information. Okay, three things. Um, what was it? Three things, diet, genetic testing, what was the middle one? Uh, yes, traditional foods and how they have it. Well, traditional foods, but there were three things, traditional foods, the genetic testing. Oh, prevention, thanks, yes. So uh, traditional foods, uh, I'm not sure what you're getting at other than I, I believe, you know, if, if there's a, I recognize the importance of traditional foods in, in, and the cultural component that provides. I also realize the, the you know, the, there's a history of significant benefit. I believe it's the yew tree that was, uh, I think in Haida Gwaii that, that was uh, used traditionally uh, many, many years ago. Um, so I acknowledge that. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure the, where you're going with the question other than I believe if, you know, if there are barriers uh, that we need to address 
to enable access to culturally appropriate foods or healers or you know th those components that are con that are consistent with the cancer mission, then we, we need to look at those. So the question is, how do you bring traditional medicines into the fold, so to speak, of, of cancer care? I'm going to ask Marianne, because I don't have the answer to that yet. I just, uh, sorry. Okay. So, I mean, I think um, the, 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 the concern that the oncologist will have is, will they interact with chemotherapy? And if they don't, I personally, and I think most of us, don't have any problems with combining things. But if there's knowledge that they'll interact with chemotherapy in a negative way, then we're not going to be in favor of it because, um, you know, we feel strongly about the therapies that we offer. And then I think it's a compromise. If, if you want to do the traditional foods, then we, then we forego some of the chemotherapy. And I think it's a decision that the, the, the physician and the um, patient make together, right? And it's, it, it, we don't tell when I practice, and I still practice, I don't tell people what to do, I advise, and I listen to what they're telling me, and then we come to a decision together about what we're gonna do. So I think that's how I would approach that. Does that help? Uh, and just around genetic testing, um, you know, the genetic testing we're talking about is effectively a lab test, and it, it, it's, it's part of the medical record, like any other component, any other lab test that, that is done. Pardon me? Yeah, it's not shared with our consent. And uh, it, that's as kind of straightforward as that, uh, or as complex as that, I guess. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the brief answers, because I, I didn't want to bog down in details so much as uh, kind of open up the box of questions. And uh, let's just have one last very quick question before, um, oh, okay, we have someone there. Sorry, I thought we were taking a question there. We're taking a question there. Uh, last question before we begin the rest of our session, which will be, uh, um, which will involve your little voters. Good morning. I'm just wondering about um if the BC Cancer Agency is um, going to pick up on the, um, it was in the news that there is a, a, a tablet that is effective on treating rats and reducing the tumor, cancer tumors, killing the cal cancer cells. And there is something on there that said um, also that most likely will not be brought to the public because of um, how inexpensive the product was. Um, I can't remember the name of that. Um, something like simple DCA or something like that. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just speak generically about, about drugs. So for drugs to be used in British Columbia, they have to be licensed in Canada and, and there's a whole Health Canada process for that uh, to ensure safety and, and regulation and all those components. Uh, once that happens, there's a, there's a prioritization process that occurs. Um, and that is a, quite a complex process because we look at the burden of disease, i.e. how many people have the condition. We look at the benefit that the drug provides. Uh, we look at the, the cost of that benefit, so to speak. Uh, and then we have to evaluate that across every, all the other drugs as well. So, uh, sorry, I can't talk to the specifics of, of that drug because I don't know. Do you know that one, Marian? Do you want to mention? Is there a microphone for Marian? And it has a lot of side.
Thank you very much. And we will leave more time for, uh, for questions at the end of each session, because we have three questions that we would like to address to you. But before we get to that, uh, I would like to remind you that um, we will be handing out a survey towards the end of our session together. Um, this survey um, is very important to us. In fact, so important to us, we're offering uh, a prize or prizes uh, for the completion of it, which includes winning an iPad. So uh, we hope that you're interested in having a new iPad and you're interested in our survey um, on cancer, uh, cancer services and First Nations. Great. Uh, so the next part of our session will be three questions. We will give you several minutes um, to discuss each question actually about um, between 12 and 14 minutes, depending how our timing is going. Uh, you'll be staying at your tables for this discussion. There should be a recorder um, at your table. Is that correct? People can write down their um, answers on a central piece of paper to the three questions. And I'm hoping that the three questions will be posted for you. If they're not posted on the PowerPoint um, in the front, we will ask you to write them down so you can discuss them. And before we uh, start discussing, we're going to start each session with a, with a quiz. So uh, for the quiz, you will need your little voting devices. Sorry, I don't even know what these are called. I'll call them your little voting device. They're pretty self-evident in that there's a button for one or A, a button for two or B, uh, a button for three or C. And here's the question. Cancer research shows that blank of cancers can be prevented through healthy lifestyle choices and policies that protect the public. And the answer, um, and A, 25%, B, 10%, C, 50%, D, 75%. So if you could enter your vote on your little voting device, um, your answers should start to show up on the screen as you're voting, we should be able to get a sense of which percentage of you think it's A or B or C or D. I hear the answers coming in. Dr. Caron's going to say a few words. Okay. Um, First of all, it looks like most of you have a good idea, and you have uh, a great idea, 43% of you, because that's a general quote put out by the Canadian Cancer Society, is approximately 50%, or half of the cancers that are diagnosed in Canada, in some way can be traced down to preventable causes. Um, I love the optimism of 34%, and hopefully with time, uh, that will actually change as we start to absolutely eliminate the cancers that are more preventable and then you have the ones A and B. It's important to recognize and to remember that can't, there's many, many cancers that are not preventable. And that's particularly important when someone's going through the cancer journey because the last thing you want on an individual, on a family, and even in a, in a community is to think in some way that someone did something wrong. I think once a diagnosis is made, it's important to, to recognize that the next step is how do you take this journey and how do you fight this battle uh, to get through it. Any questions about this statistic or about, about this question at all? Oh, you know, I'd really like to sit down and have coffee with you. You just asked a brilliant question. The answer is no, it's not specific to Aboriginal populations. And I think what you've done is just really hit the nail on the head in terms of a lot of the statistics you hear, a lot of the data, a lot of the information that you have when it's about cancer is not specific to Aboriginal populations. And in fact, that's one of the gen a huge challenge when we're starting to understand where are we uh, in cancer care, control, prevention, treatment, um, because that data and that understanding is really, really hard to get. So Nick already sort of referred to how the First Nations Health Authority is working with the BC Cancer Agency to share some of their data, but it's an ongoing challenge, and that's something that certainly, hopefully, the First Nations Health Authority and their research division is really going to address so that we can start answering those questions, what's preventable in our First Nations, Métis, Inuit populations, 
the goal is that we're going to be able to answer that with something specific to us, for us, so that we can derive our cancer care and prevention and wellness model for data that's really appropriate to us. So it includes all of Canadians. It's a start. Great question. Thanks very much. So let's begin with our uh, discussion topics or questions. Uh, discussion topic number one, how could we reduce the risk of our community members of getting cancer? How could we reduce the risk of our community members of getting cancer? And just to help you along, though, I'm sure that many of you don't need help, you might talk about um, programs that promote exercise. Uh, we've had the idea of food introduced. Uh, we've had the idea of traditional uh, medicines uh, brought forward, healthy eating, reducing drinking and smoking, uh, physical activity programs, uh, community kitchens, gardens, just some ideas that we've heard in the past just to throw out there. But please discuss amongst yourselves and uh, put them, remember to record them on your papers uh, in the middle of the table. We will be collecting those. In fact, it would be nice if we could display them. I'm not sure if we can on these walls. But if we could uh, share some of these ideas with each other at the end, that would be great. So please, discuss amongst yourselves.
going for a ride on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. like, but what's so interesting is it's in communion that's you know compared to you know I bought a new bike two weeks ago. Oh and, uh, on day two it almost got ridden off because the guy changed the lanes on the bike. And it was just so close. And I think it but that would be interesting because that was actually my replacement bike. Uh, three minutes. You have three minutes.
All right, so if we could wind up our discussion, and if we could get the roving microphone out, if we could get the roving microphone out, I'm going to choose a couple of facilitators just to read a couple of points. Just for the sake of time, and we only have about a minute or two, I just wanted you all to hear feedback on what you've been discussing. We are sending around a contact information sheet so that we can email you the results of these discussions at every table so you have um, very good feedback on what you've contributed to us today. But just for a minute, I'd like to hear from a few facilitators a few points. Not, not in any depth. Remember, I'd like to give you about 15 seconds just to give a few points on what you've heard at your table. So any facilitator want to read a few points, 15 seconds, at the, and uh, our roving microphone will, will go to you. So how can we reduce the risk of our community members getting cancer? So um, the chief and I sat here and we discussed quite a few things. One of the things that he's very strong on is the use of more traditional foods and medicines. The other thing, though, that we, we discussed was making sure that our people get to the doctor just for regular checkups. In Alberta, we have a lot of residential school survivors who don't like to be touched because of some of the abuses they went through. So we need to be make the programs culturally appropriate so that our folks can overcome those abuses so that they can address their own mental health, uh, their own health and wellness. Thank you. Another facilitator, I'd like to read a few points. So our table discussed returning to traditional diets a lot and using traditional medicines, but we also mentioned that we should increase the monitoring of carcinogens and contaminants in traditional foods, especially in light of major polluting incidents such as the Japanese nuclear radiation disaster. Um, as well as uh, sharing resources between neighboring communities and increasing the networking be between those communities so that knowledge around traditional medicines and foods can be shared. Thank you, excellent ideas. And one more. So we also talked a lot about um, the importance of traditional foods and getting back onto the land. Uh, we talked about mentorship as well, so as you're getting back onto the land and canning workshops, food skills workshops, sharing that and mentorship within the community so that that knowledge is, is shared amongst community members. Thank you so much. And I'm very sorry we don't have time to hear from everyone. We have to move on. My apologies. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, we will be sending you these results um, if you sign in on your sign-in sheets and leave us your email, we will email you the complete results of our questions and notes from today. And again, my apologies for not being able to hear from you, but maybe at the next session, we'll try and hear from different tables um, with each question. Uh, so uh, let's, do, let's begin with the myth question uh, number two. Does treating, oh, and you'll need your small voting devices for this. Does treating cancer with surgery cause the cancer to spread throughout the body? This is a yes or no or don't know question. A for yes, B for no, C don't know. Question again, and it's in the front. Does treating cancer with surgery cause the cancer to spread throughout the body? On the last vote, we got 67 votes. And let's see, we figure there are about 80 of you here, so let's see if we can get more of you voting this time. And you see the number of responses in the corner. Thus far, we've had 56 responses, A for yes, B for no, C for don't know. And Dr. Cameron, I think this is completely out of my league. Maybe you should take this question. Can we keep the vote up? They don't want to see me. OK. So answer B. What was the What was it? Yes, no, let's see. What did most people say? Oh, it doesn't say. Okay, most people said no. Can we revert back to the answer? So 63% said no, 18% said don't know, and 19% said yes. Believe it or not, uh, I get asked this question 
a lot. And I think that it's an important question to answer because you always want to know what the pros and the cons or the risks and the benefits are of anything that you're going to be undertaking for medical care or your family member is going to be. The answer is B. It does not cause the cancer to spread throughout your body. Some of the reasons why patients, when, the, when I say that that's not something they need to worry about, some of the things they say is, well, I've heard that the cancer cells need oxygen and so when you open up the skin, the oxygen gets in and then the cancer cells get what they need, the food that they need, and they start to grow like crazy and they start to spread. So I can understand their reasoning because cancer cells do need oxygen because they're very rapidly reproducing cells. In fact, they're abnormal because of how fast they are growing and reproducing. That's what makes cancer so dangerous. The thing is, is that cancer gets its oxygen the same way that all cells in the body gets its oxygen through the blood supply. So you breathe in, you get the oxygen in your blood, the blood goes to the cells and they get it that way. So opening up uh, the skin really doesn't make, have any effect at all on the cancer cells. I think part of the myth also comes from the fact that different types of biopsies, there used to be concerns about when the needle goes in to biopsy, say, a lump on your liver, the concern is that when the needle goes in, what if when you pull the needle out, the cancer cells sort of drop off the needle a bit, and then you spread the cancer cells those way in that small area? And I think that's a valid concern. And that's something that we consider as physicians before we can say, should we biopsy it, or should we not biopsy it? Even in surgery, when I'm taking out a cancer, if I'm taking out a breast cancer or a thyroid cancer or colon cancer, we're definitely worried about that in terms of spilling some cancer cells. And then we have colleagues like radiation oncologists and uh, systemic therapy for chemotherapy that can help with cancer that spread, not only distance-wise, but the radiation can help with cancer that is invisible to the human eye but might still be there or of course radiation is there for cancer that can't be surgically removed. So the short answer is cancer or surgery does not increase the risk of cancer spreading throughout your body or what we call metastasize. Surgery has a small risk of spreading cells in that general area, but it's very minimal. And all that information should be shared with you by your surgeon when you go to see them. And it's important that if this is a question you have, I've just talked about it briefly. Make sure that you're with a surgeon that you feel comfortable asking those questions for and that your questions are respected. It is, does not cause the cancer to spread, and that's a reassuring thing, but always ask questions of your surgeon. If there's something to take away from this, make sure that you have that comfort level with any healthcare provider you're with. And again, how are we going to do that? Through the work uh, and the uh, input from you guys in terms of having a culturally competent system where we're, our voices are heard and respected. Thank you, Dr. Caron. All right, so discussion topic number two. Does treating cancer, oops, sorry. How can cancer services for community members from rural or remote communities be improved? How can cancer services for community members from rural or remote communities be improved? And you have 12 minutes. Thank you.
So you have five minutes, five minutes left, and hopefully you've learned to be brief with your comments so as many of you can speak as possible. Thank you. All right, I'm so sorry to interrupt your very involved discussion. I'm sure you found lots to talk about, but um, we have a, only a limited amount of time today, and hopefully all of you are getting used to working this quickly on these very important questions. So if there are um, three volunteers, some um, three facilitator volunteers who could take 15 seconds to read some points, uh, hopefully the roving mic is uh, nearby. At the very back, I see the first hand went up there. Great, and there, there are these two. Okay. Hello, thanks Great. everyone. Um, yeah, so some of our comments that we really focused on was to try to build community capacity for community members to become healthcare professionals. Um, nurses, a lot of times uh, community members stop at the licensed practical nurse, but have them become nurse practitioners and RNs as well as physicians, so that the um, rural areas have of healthcare providers who will actually stay. Uh, the other key thing that came in uh, all of our sessions, or all the questions, is that uh, events have to be, or any kind of screening or education events have to be combined with community cultural events that are already happening, so that um, screening c coming from the outside has to fit in with the cultural events that are already there, and that's where people will come. They said, really bring the uh, activities to where people are, and, and another focus was around uh, men are reluctant to access screening and care, so using sporting events to uh, do some education at, so go where the people are. Thank you. Uh, and another facilitator volunteer, Melanie. So there was discussion about having mobile screening that is not just for one type of cancer, so that there'd be screening for things like prostate, breast, skin cancer. Um, and also some discussion around telehealth, so it can be an issue if phone lines are down or internet is down, but it could also be good in terms of um, having a community member meet the doctor over the telehealth uh, before going down, or if their appointment's only gonna be five minutes, that would save a lot of time uh, rather than having to go all the way down to Vancouver. Thank you. 
And uh, our last facilitator volunteer. Okay, uh, so we spoke uh, about the mobile screening, about um, how that would be very valuable for the rural and remote communities, and um, also the, the need for uh, greater financial resources for medical transportation. And one of the things that was suggested was uh, to use the old hospitals as a place to provide screening. Uh, so that's what they're doing in Ashcroft. Um, to give adequate notice for appointments to reduce the no-shows. Um, let's see here. Better communication between the referring community and the cancer center. Uh, train community members to be advocates. Uh, provide greater resource materials. Uh, support communities with prevention, uh, like the smoking sensation programs that were going on. Great, thank you. Some wonderful ideas. Really very, very helpful. All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, get out your little voting devices. Question number three is, can stress cause cancer? Can stress cause cancer? A for yes, B for no, C for don't know. Can stress cause cancer? A, yes, B, no, C, don't know. And there's a question. Oh, let's talk later about the software because I have no idea. <laughs> Dr. Corona and I were uh, discussing the answer to this question. Yeah, D, I hope not. <laughs> that's good, that's funny. <laughs> Which of you came up with that? That's <laughs> and we're just waiting for the answers to come up. Oh. And uh, Dr. Caron, look, 68% said yes. 20% no, and 12% I don't know. Uh, so we were discussing and we said there is no direct evidence that stress can make changes at a cellular level, level uh, causing cancer. However, there is indirect evidence that stress-related behaviors can cause cancer. So stress coping behaviors like uh, drinking, uh, smoking, like uh, uh, food addiction and obesity can increase cancers. So, sorry, no direct evidence, but definitely stress-related behaviors contribute. So how are, we, how are we coping with our lives and what behaviors do we have that might be contributing to cancer? And that's related to resilience. Yeah, it, it, Nick said it was a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's just one of the questions that, as physicians, we get asked all the time, and hence it's sort of the, the, the reason why it hit one of our top three questions to pose to you. Um, the other thing is that what I see a lot when patients come into my office, and maybe I was supposed to see them eight months ago and they've made their way in, is they have an incredibly stressful event that's happened in their life that has trumped everything. Or sometimes I see patients and then I say, you know, are you up to date on your mammogram? And they say, oh, you know, I'm just, it's just so stressful. I just got a new job and, you know, my, I have, my kids are teenagers now or it, there's multiple different things that happen in life that are stressful. And one of the other things is uh, I think as a people that we're always used to looking after our family and our communities, and what we have to remember is that it's so important to look after ourselves, even during stressful moments, stressful times, stressful years in our life. And so making sure that the stress uh, coping mechanisms that Evan talked about, but also recognizing that even during stressful times, to find that spot to look after yourself for preventative measures and for screening measures so that we can stop the cancer journey there so you don't have to go down the diagnosis and treatment journey that uh, Nick put up there before. So an indirect link, but not at the cellular level, making the cells change into cancer uh, when you're going through stress. 
thank you. And we hear from uh, survivors that their mental health, not just their physical health, is important. So the, how they're feeling and how they're feeling about their diagnosis um, and where they find themselves at the point of their diagnosis uh, are important issues. So thank you very much. So, very, so a, lot of, um, uh, a lot to consider in this question. The next discussion topic is um, what, can, what culturally specific resources or other supports can be provided to improve the cancer journey for our community members? So the question is about culturally specific resources, and you have 10 minutes. Eight and a half. Eight and a half, maybe. I'm trying to shepherd you along so you can do your survey. And um, we have some graphics up here that we would like you to contribute to as well. This is your one-minute warning. 
or one minute warning. My apologies to discuss your, or to um, pull you back from your discussion early. Hopefully you've had time to respond sufficiently to this question. I do urge you to write an answer down if you haven't had time and leave it with your facilitator. I'm cutting your discussion short, my apologies. Please write your answers down on a piece of paper to leave with your facilitator. Um, two facilitators, please, to discuss what uh, has been put forward to them at their table. Two facilitators, we'll go really quickly. Great, and the roving mic, I hope, is here. Where's the roving mic? or community is very individual and unique in what they do with their um, spirituality and customs and traditions. It's very diverse, so it needs to be looked into for each um, area. And does language help? Um, and there was discussion about putting a video or a DVD together to explain how the process would be and uh, to combine the medical terms with the layman's terms and utilize family members or friends that um, people can recognize um, and feel more safe and comfortable. Thank Include you. traditional healers for community and have it be um, the individual client's um, uh, choice. Thanks so, very much. And one last uh, facilitator, just to round off our discussion. Those are all great ideas. We also had a, a lot of conversation about traditional medicine and how um, teas uh, for patients can improve health, quality of life, and extend life. And um, also daily support from community health reps that are already in the community. Thank you. And I'd also include cultural workers along with traditional healers um, that might be of some service. Thank you so much, all of you, for your responses to these three questions. That's been really um, very, very helpful to all of us who are working here. Um, there are surveys that are on your table that we would like for you to complete before you go. Um, so if you could, uh, if you're having trouble with a survey or if you don't have a survey, please put your hands up. We'll bring you one. And after you finish the survey, um, there are graphics up here that we would like for you to come and put stickers on. Oh, here they are. Here's an example, and there are several on the floor here, um, where you can put stickers for cancers sure. that have affected your families. So, uh, um, and uh, if you are from Vancouver Coastal, we ask you to put in a red sticker. If you're from Vancouver Island, a yellow sticker. Uh, an orange sticker if you're from the interior. If you're from Fraser, a blue sticker. And if you're from the north, a green sticker. And don't worry, we'll leave, we'll leave this up here. Just put a sticker um, of the appropriate color for your area and put it um, on a part of the body of a family member or on the graphic of a cancer that might have affected uh, you or a family member. Thanks very much. And that will be before your break. Uh, one last item. Please leave your clickers behind. Please leave your clickers behind. <laughs>
When you complete your survey, please hand them back to one of our volunteers and they will give you a ticket for the draw for two mini iPads, which will occur tomorrow afternoon at the Beefy Cheeps finale. So when you finish your survey, just hand it back to one of our volunteers. They'll give you a ticket for a draw for tomorrow afternoon, Beefy Chiefs, where we will give away two iPads, mini iPads. All right, you are now officially on break. So if, if you could um, just take a few minutes to finish your survey and come and put a, a dot on our graphic, that would be great. For those of you who need to leave, you can drop your survey off at Salon B downstairs beside the trade fair. If you need to leave, you can drop off your survey downstairs beside the trade fair in Salon B and you'll get your ticket when you hand it in. I'd like to thank you all once again and thank you to our guests. I don't know if I should call you guests. We set this up together. <laughs> thanks. Oh, yes. Thanks to our partners, all of you here, all of the volunteers for this session. It's been very, very fruitful, full of fruit. And thank you again to all of you. So the next session will be starting in about 15 minutes, uh, and I think there will be some announcements in a minute probably over the PA, but uh, just so you know, you can sign up for an evening reception tonight at reception. Uh, there will be food provided, uh, so go talk to the people at reception and check that out. Also, go down and check out the trade show. There's a whole bunch of really interesting artisans and different things happening on the second floor. And all of the PowerPoints for all of the presentations will be available in the forum final report, which will be posted on our website. Test, test. Uh, good morning. Just have a few announcements, a few reminders. Some people might call them commercial break. Um, we're going to do some advertising, but just uh, more reminders for you. Um, we can hear uh, cricket, uh, cricket calls, uh, so please visit the trade show. Uh, complete your passport to win some fabulous door prizes. So those passports, remember you can uh, go to the trade show and get them filled out. Don't forget to sign up for our evening reception from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock tonight. Um, dinner is provided. Um, so there's a hundred, first hundred people to sign up. Uh, did you also know that there was the uh, uh, breakout sessions that are happening on the 34th floor. The 34th floor is also your health screening. So uh, please go up and uh, see what's going on on the 34th floor.
one, two, 